It all started in 2017 when Marco bought the whiteboard on Craigslist for 100 bucks. Since then he became one of the most influential finance YouTubers. In this video I'm gonna be talking to him to see what tips he has to give us on investing, YouTube growth and entrepreneurship. This is going to be an epic video and make sure to watch till the end. Here we are with Marco Whiteboard Finance. What's up Marco? What's How are you man? George? Thank you for having me buddy. <laughs> Thank you for joining me today. So can you just tell us about yourself? You are extremely successful at YouTube. How did you start it and how did you come up to idea like I'm gonna start filming YouTube videos in front of the whiteboard? Uh, so I started in November of 2017. So I wanted to be a financial advisor. I went to University of Akron, got my bachelor's degree uh, in finance. Uh, and then I graduated into the global financial crisis in 2000, 2010. <laughs> Fun time, right? Yeah, so I graduated December of 2010, a couple of years after, but that's when unemployment was high. So I ended up selling cars, worked in commercial real estate, worked in a bank, publicly traded bank, uh, worked for Marcus and Milchap, Key Bank, a couple other places. Um, worked for a boutique real estate developer, but I never scratched the itch of becoming a financial advisor. Um, so what I did was I had a nice DSLR camera that I was going to get into photography with. It was collecting dust, never really used it. Uh, so my brother-in-law and I we went on Craigslist. I bought a big whiteboard, a big dry erase board, and then I just started teaching uh, personal financial concepts on YouTube with, wow. with that camera. That's crazy. Yeah. So How much did you pay for the whiteboard? Oh, the whiteboard, I forgot. It was maybe like, I don't know, 100 bucks. It was pretty big. It's a, it's a big so, whiteboard. Sounds like a good return to me. Right? Yeah, the return has been probably, you know, a million percent, you know, because basically uh, the nice thing about this is, you know, we're filming this right now. We're using, you know, just maybe a few hundred dollars yeah. worth of equipment and we're creating content. So that's why I think YouTube is a great opportunity for anyone. Exactly. And what would you say, like, you have almost a million subscribers? You know, I think you're going to hit million this month, probably. You know? I hope so. We'll see. Yeah. So there is a lot of fake gurus and I have a feeling that everyone nowadays wants to be a finance YouTuber. When you, <laughs> yeah. when you started out, there was maybe a few. Yep. Right. So yeah, there's definitely different tiers. So there's a couple guys that were, uh, you know, maybe 2014, 2015. And you have like the other generation of like other YouTubers. Everyone knows who they are. Uh, and then you have like the Graham Steffens of the world, the Meet Kevins, for example. And then there's new, newer and newer generations. But yeah, when I started, man, there wasn't as many. Um, but now I feel like a lot of people get into YouTube for the wrong reasons. And finance is one of those um, yeah. niches just because you can make you know a lot of money. Right. But it's pretty obvious to see, you know, who knows who, who knows what they're talking yeah, about, exactly. and who doesn't. But to new people, they may not necessarily know that. So if you don't know mm, anything about finance, yeah you're going to believe whoever's on the screen, right? Exactly. So at that point, it's just the algorithm search yeah. engine optimization game. So um, yeah, I think anyone should follow someone that at least has some credibility mm -hmm. in the finance world previous to making videos. You don't need to do that. But if I'm watching someone who's a realtor who's actually selling yeah. 20, 30, 50 houses a year, you know, like yourself versus someone who's just talking about, you know, yeah. being a real estate <laughs> investor, that's a big difference. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I feel like you should kind of do your own due diligence on whoever you're getting information from. Exactly. And like, it's really challenging here for real estate and for the market. So what would you say it's going to, I'm, I'm not saying you have a crystal ball, but what do you think is going to happen with the home prices in the next, let's say 12 months? Yes. Yeah, so at the time of this recording, the 10 year treasury is down. It was almost 5% just, uh, I believe in middle of October. Now it's down to about 3.8% which we should see mortgage rates start to follow that. Mm -hmm. You know, they it typically follows the 10-year treasury. So it's basically a supply and demand game and also an affordability game. So most Americans, you know, hey, can I fit it into my budget? What can I fit into my monthly budget? That's how everyone makes these purchasing decisions because uh, no one's going to be buying a house for cash or rarely unless you're yeah, moving from, exactly. you know, California to Cleveland or something, <laughs> right? But my, my point is, is that interest rates are going down, which is going to make these houses seem more affordable, AKA I can fit it into my monthly budget. And there's also a supply constraint, which we both know. Um, so I don't see it moving much unless you're maybe on the coast or like an Austin yeah. or, you know, uh, you know, a high flying market like a Scottsdale or Tampa or something like that. So I still think it's going to be, you know, pretty hot in my opinion. 
Yeah, it's I, I'm a real estate agent and I make money when somebody buys and sells. But I, <laughs> I have to admit it's it's really challenging. Even for me, I'm looking to buy a house next year, hopefully, and it's extremely challenging. And I think a lot of people are being just priced out of the market. Yeah, absolutely. I feel bad for younger people. I mean, you're you're in your mid twenties. I'm in my mid thirties. You know, I couldn't imagine, you know, getting into this market, trying to buy a house right now as a young person. You know, if you're already established in your career, making some money, yes, you know, depending on where you live, you can afford it. But, you know, as a young person getting their first big boy, big girl job, you know, it's not easy, man. I, I, I sympathize with those people for sure. My, my opinion is that we're going to be a nation of renters. Um, similar to Germany, I think yeah. it's going to be probably uh, majority of the people will be renters as opposed to homeowners. Yeah. So do you think like I, I watched some of the Grand Cardone's Cardone's video? Yeah. How do you pronounce it? Uh, Cardone. Yeah. Cardone. Yeah. Videos. And he said it makes sense to rent for some people. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it does. It depends on where you're at in life. It, mm -hmm. it depends on uh, say you have two different people. One person is changing jobs all the time. They're moving across the country, across the world. Um, you know, they don't have a stable. I don't want to say stable, but they don't have, you know, a spouse, kids, you know, community that they're yeah. part of. And they're always changing jobs well why would that person need to buy a home right exactly. it makes no sense yeah. or you're a traveling nurse for example um, if you're someone who knows hey i'm gonna i have a solid career i'm gonna stay in this uh, community I, i'm a part of this community uh, i'm gonna live here forever i'm gonna raise my kids here then at that point you know buying makes more sense so i just think about um you know how long are you going to be in that mm -hmm. home that's usually what it boils down to for me so when it comes to investing do you think real estate is still good investment and how would you let's say invest 100,000 if you had now, would you spread it on the market or buy some real estate or crypto? Yes. So I typically look at my net worth as like a pie. Mm -hmm. So like different uh, slices of the pie are just yeah. different asset classes. Um, so for me personally, I usually have about 35% of my net worth in real estate, um, have certain percentages in stocks, you know, about the same. And then the rest is, you know, uh, Bitcoin, things like that. But the way that I, to answer your first question, I still think uh, real estate is obviously a good investment. It just depends on how you buy it. You make your money when you buy, not when you sell. Um, and then also just depends on the market cycle. You know, right now I probably wouldn't, you know, a lot of deals aren't penciling unless yeah. you find something from probate, yellow letters, off market, you know, text messages, whatever. Um, so it all just depends on how you buy it. Um, also, the second thing is if I had $100,000, um, I'd probably divide that based on my pie system as well. Mm -hmm. So if I had a hundred grand, probably 35 would go into real estate, 35 would go into stocks, and then the rest would go into the other things that make up my pie. Uh, that way I know I'm not going too crazy in one certain asset class. But at the end of the day, it all just depends on ROI. You yeah. know, where do you think you're going to achieve the highest return uh, with the least amount of risk? Exactly. So, for example, for me, I'm a young guy, I moved to this country recently, and house hacking seems really attractive, like an idea to create wealth. 100%. But prices are so like crazy for these doubles where I want to live, and it doesn't cover 100% of my mortgage, but it can cover up to 60-70%. Yep. Do you think that's still a good deal? What would you say? Yeah, if I had a time machine, George, I would go back and buy a duplex um, when I graduated college. I mean, I didn't have any money, I had student <laughs> yeah. debt, but my point is, is that um, I think house hacking is still one of the best ways to build wealth quickly in this country um, because like you said, even if you're not going to be living for free, at least you'll be living at a significantly reduced yeah. rate. And as you pay down or eventually pay off that mortgage um, or when you decide to move out in the numbers pencil, um, you may not only be seeing positive cash flow, but you're also having your tenants pay down um, that debt, which mm -hmm. is you know, increasing your equity and your overall net worth um, over time. Um, and then if that property is free and clear, you can always take, you know, a HELOC, cash out refi. Uh, you can leave it free and clear and cash flow. It's, it, you know, there's a lot of benefits that come from owning real estate. Um, so I think house hacking is probably the, the fastest way to wealth for a young person. Exactly. And one of the, I think that I agree 100%. And I think one of the hardest things about house hacking is selling your wife on the idea. That exactly. Yeah. It just, you have to get your spouse on board if you have a significant <laughs> yeah. other. Um, but yeah, to your all, point, all joke aside, I yeah. mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good investment strategy. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I agree. So you recently had a baby second, y yeah, child. second baby. How yeah. does having a baby affect your entrepreneurship life? Oh, it's well, here's the thing. So you want to spend, you know, so much time with them, but then you also have a business. So you got to find that fine balance, you know, between work and life and family. But, um, it definitely motivates you because you, you know, at least as a man, 
um, you know, you feel like you need to provide, you know, it's kind of exactly. like in your blood, you know. Um, so I have two girls, a two and a half year old and a four month old. And um, yeah, you know, when you have someone relying on you putting food into their stomach, you know, you just feel like you need to figure things out and you'll do whatever is necessary. So um, from the entrepreneurial side, yes, entrepreneurship is risky. So if I want to tie in a little bit of personal finance here, I always say, hey, if you're a single guy or gal, you know, always have three months of savings saved up mm -hmm. for emergency. Uh, if you're someone who has a family, you know, six months. And then if you're someone who's maybe like yourself who works on commission or has a business, you know, maybe even save up for 12 months worth of expenses. I know that sounds very risk averse and very defensive, um, but you can also use that money to invest as well. But I sleep well at night knowing that I have, you know, 12 months of reserves in the bank at all times. That, yeah, that makes sense. And um, what if somebody is watching this and I'm, I'm Joe, I'm 23, I'm broke. Yeah. I have college debt and everything yeah. and I'm struggling to pay my bills, but I want to be financial free sometimes. What, what, what is a step by step guide, let's say, to reach financial freedom at young age? Yep. So assuming that scenario where the person has student loans, assuming they finished or have some sort of degree, um, I always go in this order of operations. It's find an income producing skill or a marketable skill or a skill that the marketplace finds valuable. So you don't necessarily need a degree. It could be certifications in IT. It could be um, doing something that no one wants to do. It could be, you know, whatever. Um, so invest in yourself, make yourself differentiated from other people. That way you can increase your income. And when you increase your income, that's when you can learn how to manage your money. And then when you learn how to manage your money, that's when you can start investing in stocks, real estate, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think it's all about increasing your income because no matter what, you know, these personal finance people will tell you on YouTube, you can't save your way to wealth. It's not possible. Um, you know, if you make, you know, 30 grand a year, like Joe in this example, for example, um, you know, he could save, you know, 50% of his income, but what's his lifestyle going to be? He's living exactly. off 15 grand a year. Like what, what, when you're eating ramen and peanut butter, <laughs> like, you know, you may have to do that when times are tough, but you need to increase your income. That's the number one most important thing. So in make more, spend less, right? Yeah. Make more, spend less. Hey, Ramsey, just, 101. Yeah. It's just like working <laughs> out, right? If you want to lose weight, you need to burn more calories than you take in. It's very simple. Yeah. So let's talk about your YouTube growth and Whiteboard Finance University. You you seem like a genuine guy, very humble, and you're one of my favorite YouTubers. You know, you. you're not salesy, you're not <laughs> trying to sell anything to us. Thank you, you know, but now you start the Whiteboard Finance University. Great community, by the way. Yes, so, you're a member. George is a member. <laughs> yeah, you. I'm I'm a very proud member of the community. Thank you. So can you tell us more about your YouTube mission and mission to teach people financial literacy. Yeah. So the whole reason I started the channel was because like you, you know, my parents are immigrants. I didn't have a silver spoon in my mouth. I didn't have anybody teaching me about any of this stuff. So I just wanted to make it as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. And that's why I think I've had success or found success on YouTube um, because I don't really push anything. Um, but what to, to what you alluded to is I did start a membership group called Whiteboard Finance University. You're a member of it. Basically, what I try and teach is like the four pillars of wealth. So you have um, uh, money management, increasing your income, and then we have stocks and real mm -hmm. estate, right? So we have professors for each one of these things. Professors are just kind of like, think of like a personal trainer. Yeah. You know how it is. So we have Axel Ragnarsson. He's a commercial real estate guy. Uh, we have Jacob Wade. Uh, he's a writer yeah, for great Fortune. Guy. Yeah, all these people are super vetted, super great people. And then Nathan Winkelpleck, he's a CFA, Charter yeah. Financial Analyst. Uh, he's the stock market guy. So it's just basically me and three other subject matter experts. We just added John Williamson. Uh, he's also a certified financial planner. Um, so what it is, is it's basically just a community of like and similar people of trying to increase their wealth and put their money where it's best utilized over time. Um, and I think we've done a good job of that. It's pretty affordable in my opinion. <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah. So, Here's a scammer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't listen to me. Yeah. This is, I made all this up. Yeah. It's, it's really nice. I, and I think there is no, like there is, I cannot find the community that's similar to that yeah, one. Yeah. Thank you. It's very true. unique. Thank and you. we have one, one live call. Yeah. You know, one, I, live, one live stream a week. We have subject matter experts every month. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm very proud of the people we've had on so far. We had Roman. He's actually another Cleveland guy. Um, we had a bunch of people, yeah, real estate investors, entrepreneurs, uh, stock market guys, you name it. Amazing. So how long did it take for you to reach first thousand subscribers? Maybe somebody is looking to start a YouTube channel, like give us some tips and how long did it take for you? And when did you start 
when did you start seeing that compounding effect let's say yeah that's a good question so i i mean i actually picked the video in the beginning to where my whole style is like evergreen so videos that are going to be talked mm, about yeah. or searched for you know now until the end of time uh you know how to tie a tie right everyone's going to search how to tie a tie yeah. you know once in their lives so that's those are the types of videos i try and make so um, and then you have trending. So something mm -hmm. that's a little bit more trending, like, oh, Elon Musk buys a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin, right? Yeah. That's in the news, you know, something that's trending. Uh, and then on top, you know, if you think of it like a pyramid, on top, I like to have something that's a little bit inflammatory or sensational, mm -hmm. you know, how car dealerships rip you off, yeah, right? I, I saw something that. Something like viral, you know, that, or the potential to go viral. So if I, if I had to break down my content schedule, I would do it like that, um, you know, evergreen, trending, and then sensational. Um, that's what I would recommend. And then uh, I actually reached a thousand subscribers pretty quickly because I had some trending topics mm -hmm. that did well. Um, so again, going back to that pyramid, you know, evergreen on the bottom, trending in the middle, sensational on top. So how do you, I mean, I, I saw that video, how dealership trip you Yeah, on. yeah. Yeah. So how well do you think, how is it hard to make a living on YouTube? That's my question. Yeah, I would say um, you don't go into it trying to make a living because mm -hmm. if you're going into it trying to make money, the second you don't find success for the first you know, yeah. six to 12 months, you're going to quit. Um, so I don't recommend anyone try and make a living from it. If you want to be strategic about it and build a portfolio of videos over time, tying it in with affiliate marketing, you know, sponsorships when you're big enough to get them, uh, selling your own products, things like that that's where you can make a living from it. But I wouldn't go into it trying to make money. I would exactly. go into it trying to be providing as much value as possible by being a teacher, a professor, an educator, or whatever your subject is. You could be an entertainer, you could be whatever, but um, I wouldn't go into it trying to make money. Yeah, it looks it looks very inconsistent. So it like is. AdSense and everything. It is. Does, it is. does most of your income come from AdSense or from sponsorships or affiliates? It depends on the year. I think this year I'd say a majority is probably, it's close, it's probably 50-50 of like mm. sponsorships and ad yeah. revenue. Um, but you know, the way you complete that business is, as I just mentioned, you should, you should add revenue should just be gravy. It yeah. shouldn't be what you rely to live on, right? That should just be gravy. Uh, so you have ad revenue, you have sponsorships, you have affiliates, you have your own products, you have, you know, a bunch of different ways to make money. Um, but what I would recommend is if you have something to sell, like say you're yeah. a realtor, right? You're selling yourself, your business, whatever. Um, always put that first and yeah. then add revenue, sponsorships, affiliates, that should be secondary. So that's a big thing that I didn't do, didn't do in the beginning. And that's why I started Whiteboard Finance University is just to help as many people as possible, um, but also kind of create more of a stable income for myself as well. Exactly. So, so at one point you had to say, okay, I'm not working this nine to five job anymore. Yeah. You know, how much do you have to make or what part of your income does it have to be to say, you know, screw this, I'm out. Yes, yeah, so I was, a YouTuber. Yeah, so I was <laughs> working at Key Bank at the time. It's a regional bank here in Cleveland. Uh, when my uh, channel, sorry, I thought someone was behind yeah, me. I know. Uh, when my uh, channel started to blow up, and I didn't, I didn't quit my job until like I had like, I'd say four to six months of solid uh, revenue results from YouTube, and that's when I talked to my wife. I said, "Hey, you know, this is doing pretty well. I'm making just as much, if not more, on YouTube than I am, you know, at my day job." Um, you know, what do you think? And she's like, oh, you know, well, knock on wood at the time, we didn't, well, we still don't have any debt, but uh, we didn't have kids, didn't have a mortgage, you know, nothing like that. So she's like, yeah, go ahead and do it. So I went full time. That was um, June of 2020 or no, 2019. 2019. 2019. Yeah. So I started the channel November of 17, went full time June 2019. And now it's going to be almost 2024. So nice. Almost so, four and a half years, basically. Those are the tips that you have for young people who want to start a YouTube channel. Like, just be be yourself, you know, put yes. your business first. Yes, put your business first if you are selling something. If you're not, um, don't... See, this is the thing. I'm, I'm a little bit older. I'm in yeah. my mid-30s. I don't want my kids wanting to be a YouTuber or a social media yeah. influencer or any of that stuff. Like, I feel like if they have something to teach or entertain or whatever, that's fine. But it shouldn't be, it should be a side passion that turns into a full-time mm -hmm. thing. You shouldn't shoot for it to be a full-time full thing right away because you may either 
get disappointed. It may be inconsistent. You may, you know, go nuts trying to come out with videos every week. Yeah. You know, I would, I would go from passion to, mm -hmm. to full-time income if possible. That makes sense. Exactly. Yeah, you seem like a very private person for a YouTuber. You're not. I am like not a YouTuber, bro. Yeah. I'm not an influencer. I'm not a YouTuber. I, exactly, couldn't, care, yeah. I couldn't care less about any social media. I wouldn't be on social media if it wasn't for my channel. I, yeah. I swear to God, I wouldn't be on social media. Um, but the thing is, it's kind of like a necessary thing. You have to be. Um, I'm not your typical. I don't want attention. I don't care. Exactly. Like I, I'd rather be like wealthy and unknown, <laughs> you know, than famous and you know broke or whatever. But what I'm trying to say is, is I feel like social media now it's a little bit dangerous because you kind of have to be on it, especially if you yeah. have a business and stuff like that. But don't make it your whole personality. Yeah. You got to keep some of your own life to yourself, if that makes sense. It makes per perfect sense. So it seems like your whole life philosophy is like dive at zero. That, that's the yeah, book. That's Dive the with book. Zero. That's it's a great book. book. You, yeah, you Bill, like to Bill, mention. Bill Perkins, Dive with Zero. Highly recommend it. You're saying in order to make a living on YouTube, you got to diversify, right? Yeah. So what's your long-term goal for YouTube? And do you see YouTube becoming like uh, next TV, let's say? Yeah. Um, so I think my long-term goal with YouTube, I've been doing it for six years. Um, at some point, you know, a lot of creators, you know, they'll say, you know, I get burnt out or this and that. I want to just get to a point kind of where I'm at where, hey, you know, I can put out a video a week. I can be active in the community, um, Whiteboard Finance University. Um, I, I'm not, I can be a present father mm -hmm. with my kids, with my wife, things like that. So as long as those boxes are checked, I mean, that's kind of what I like to do. For me, YouTube is a lifestyle business. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be some you know, six figure a month business, which is fine. You know, it can be, it very well can be, especially if you have your own products. Um, but for me, it's a lifestyle business and I like doing it. The day that I stop like making videos or, or don't enjoy making videos any longer, um, that's when I'm going to quit. Um, so I'll be honest, you know, it's, you know, some people will look at that and say, well, you worked all these years and built all these videos and did all this stuff. Why would you just, you know, quit? I mean, if you don't like what you're doing, you know, life is too short. So exactly. That's kind of that's kind of how I do it. You know, that's that's my philosophy. But, you know, it's been good to me so far. Knock on wood. You know, I made a living from it, um, and I have my time back. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, you know, went from not making a penny for a year, you know, a year and a half. It took my channel forever to get monetized, not because of metrics, but because a lot of stuff was going on six, seven years ago when I was able to be monetized. Um, to where you went through a review process, it took years. There was a lot of ad, ad stuff that I don't want to get into in this video. But basically, I didn't make a penny for a year, a year and a half, and then you know I made a lot of money over the past few years. Um, so I know what it's like on both sides of the coin. Yeah. So you just gotta be consistent. That's what you're trying to say. Be right? consistent, and if you don't like it, you know, don't do it. You know, you have to sacrifice. You have to know that some things in life are worth pursuing. Um, so that's why I stuck through that year, year and a half for not making any money. And then you're re you're rewarded for mm. that work. You know, it's, it's like building anything from the ground exactly. up. Yeah. So for the end, can you just recommend us a few books? What do you like to read? Like, recommend us a few books that change your financial life, or it can be entrepreneurship, it can be philosophy, whatever. Yeah. So the cliche pick, but I believe in it, is Rich Dad Poor Dad. Yeah, Robert exactly. Kiyosaki. I think once you understand that paradigm shift between assets and liabilities that's when you, your mind will go into kind of entrepreneurship investment mode. Um, you know, until that happens, you're probably just going to be typical consumer. Hey, the next thing came out, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to watch TV. I'm going to sit on my ass. I'm not going to do anything. Next thing you know, you're 40, 50, 60 years old. Your whole life went by, right? When you're young, you have the energy, the vitality, the drive, the focus. You don't have necessarily the responsibility of wife, kids, things like that. That's when you should grind. You should grind in your 20s to be able to enjoy, you know, your 40s. That's the way that I look at it. Exactly. Yeah. So, Bridge Dad, Poor Dad, is there anything else? Any other book? Oh, there's so many. Die with Zero. As yeah, I like, yeah, so I'm glad you brought that back up. I like, I like Die with Zero because Bill Perkins, very successful. Mm. I believe he made his money in oil and gas trading, um, futures, I think. Um, but he's, you know, multi, multi, multi millionaire. Um, He's, I actually found him because I'm a big, I like playing poker. I'm a fan of poker. I like watching poker. For some reason, I just like it. To me, it's kind of like, um, like investment banking chess. <laughs> yeah. if that makes sense. I know. But makes. yeah, I love, I love poker. So Bill, Bill is a huge poker player, but he's also very successful, you know, uh, oil and gas trader. And then also he wrote a book called Die with Zero. Mm -hmm. So his whole philosophy is, um, you know, why would I save money in my twenties instead of taking the trip to Europe? 
you know, when I can't even enjoy it in my, you know, 50s and 60s because mm -hmm. my body's not the same, my mentality's not the same. I'm only going to be able to enjoy certain things at certain points in my life. Um, and that's kind of like the first part of the book. I don't want to ruin it for anyone, but the whole the whole philosophy is die with zero, yeah. right? It's you don't need to take money to, you, to with you to the grave, but you should be able to enjoy your time on earth, you know, and you have time to make money as well. Exactly. So it's knowing when to enjoy, you know, the money, knowing when to focus, knowing when to relax, mm -hmm. uh, work hard, play hard, kind of a thing. Yeah, it's so. I mean, die with zero. It's a great philosophy. It's so hard, especially in this country, like to know when it's enough, like yeah. money is on every corner, like every business idea can turn you into next Jeff Bezos, basically. Yeah. You know, so how do you know when to stop? Yeah. So for me personally, that's a great question. So I always, my philosophy is golden middle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so in Serbian, we say Zlatna Sredina, like golden middle for me just means that, hey, um, no, it's almost like Ramit Sethi's money dials. So it's like, hey, I drive a Honda Accord, but then I also splurge on certain yeah. things, right? You know, like I have a X5 BMW, you know, it's a nice SUV, but then I also don't do other dumb stuff with my money, right? Yeah. So for me, it's finding that golden middle, right? So find out what's important to you. Um, you know, don't, don't go crazy by being too cheap. Don't go crazy by spending too much. You know, find that golden middle and that's kind of the way I live my life. So Nice, man. Yeah. And thank you so much for being the part of George Show. Yeah. <laughs> it's my pleasure. George V. George V. George V. Yeah, yeah. That's, your new, that's your new name. <laughs> your name. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, yeah, man. Yeah, my pleasure, man. Right. Of course. Thank, thank you, you, George.